What you are about to see is a piece of history, a ceremony as old as kings. A purple catafalque in Westminster's Great Hall has been the heart of a nation's homage to a great sovereign. King George VI of blessed and glorious memory. By centuries old tradition, the last journey of a monarch is from Westminster where he is crowned to St. George's Chapel, Windsor. Following behind their late sovereign are the four royal dukes, Windsor, Gloucester, Edinburgh, and Kent. A mile-long procession escorts the coffin, carrying the symbols of majesty, the crown, the orb, and the scepter. Upon the arrival of the royal train, the Queen's standard had been unfurled on the masthead over the round tower signifying the entrance of the Queen into Windsor. At Windsor, it's a smaller procession now, as it assumes a more medieval note, backed by the beat of muffled drums and the mournful lament of the pipes. To the shrill sound of the bosun's pipes, 1952 makes its own offerings to this hallowed sepulchre. King George VI is laid to rest beside his noble ancestors. There are ceremonies also for those who are not kings, but who have also served their country. In the New World, the burial of a soldier by his comrades brought to light traditions of the Old World. The timeless honoring of a fallen comrade. The arms salute. the musical salute. To remember all the war dead, we too march in ceremony and ritual. Our respect for fallen comrades. Without ceremony, their sacrifice would fade. Their lives and deaths would be erased. Every year, the ceremony becomes a duty. And the duty becomes a ceremony. Because they gave too much not to be remembered. Our ceremonies are, for the most part, the celebrations of history, the traditional markings of military customs. Hey! 
William the Conqueror wanted Londoners to know that he had come to stay when he built the Tower of London. This formidable complex has been in turn a royal palace, an arsenal, a state prison, and a fortress which has never been captured. Generations of men have taken these steps, marched this march, performed exactly as their ancestors had performed, the ceremony of the keys. Originally, this was a practical way of protecting the crown jewels in the Tower of London. Now it has become a ritual steeped in history, steeped in time. No other building has a history which is more regal or gruesome, as witnessed by the graffiti which scars the walls from prisoners who have been executed or just imprisoned here. The red tunics originated as a copy of the king's livery to identify British troops from others when on foreign soil during the 1400s. All British troops at home and overseas had adopted the red tunics by the 18th century. Now there are other uniforms for war, but the red tunic remains for ceremonial occasions. Trooping the color before Her Majesty on horse guards parade in June every year on her official birthday. Canada, many of our ceremonies are borrowed, but we have some that are our own. These symbols are a continuing reminder of our duty. As we move toward nationhood, we developed our own symbols of independence, and with them, our own traditions. This was the first time our own flag flew over our own capital. The day was February 15th, 1965. In 1910, our Navy was formally established. We borrowed another form of ceremony. Fifty years later, on the Atlantic coast, sailors now pass in review before their chief of naval staff, in the same way as the sailors of Nelson and Drake sailed before their commanding officer. And what would Nelson and Drake have thought of these ships? What would they have thought of the new weapons of war? Were their fighting men the forefathers of our fighting men? Undoubtedly, yes. As part of the 50th anniversary celebrations, the officers and men of Atlantic Command trooped the Queen's color before the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. When paraded, the Queen's color is given the same respect as if the Queen herself were present. The trooping of the color is a special ceremony, a symbolic tribute and reaffirmation of loyalty and commitment, a timeless declaration of sovereign and people, united in one cause, cemented by ceremony. 
As long as there have been soldiers, there has been ceremony. They were once the heroes, the champions. They were idolized and feared. In Victorian England, before baseball cards, the uniforms and regiments were collected by eager boys who themselves would end up in the battlefields of the First World War. They read of victories and defeats, and they learned the trivia of military life. They learned also of ceremonies and symbols as they watched the great painters of the day immortalize our past, lest we forget. Scotland forever. The death of Colonel Moorhouse at Bangalore. Death of General Wolfe. Napoleon crossing the Alps. The Battle of Volmy. The Battle of Hanau. Balaclava. Closing up. What was once a desperate battle for life has become a spectacle. These teams of sailors commemorate the days when sailing ships carried field guns and gunners. The gunners who could take a gun apart, get it to where they had to be, and put the gun together again ready for action, were the gunners who stayed alive. Where once they did it to survive, they now do it for pride. It is the pride in what has gone before that has linked these 20th century sailors during Canada's Centennial Tattoo, 1967, with their 18th century ancestors. Number two of His Majesty Ship Shannon. God save the King. It is tradition also that makes these men of the Queen's own rifles march past at this fast pace. During the Peninsular War, men of the light infantry covered 40 miles in one day and went straight into battle. They had no tanks, no armored cars, no troop carriers. They ran carrying rifles because rifles were lighter than muskets. And so when the Queen's own march passed, they commemorate that event in history. It was here in 1977 that 434 Squadron made some of its own history. At the service of consecration in front of old comrades and friends, the new standard was first displayed. On it, past battle honors had been emblazoned. English Channel and North Sea, 1943-44. The Baltic, 1943-44. Fortress Europe, 1943-44. France and Germany, 1944-45. German ports, 1944-45. Normandy and the Rhine, 1944. The standard is presented to the squadron, a symbol of pride and loyalty. It is also a lasting memorial to those of 434 Squadron who served fought and died in the squadron service. To some, 
the honors will conjure up battles that were fought and won by faceless men in a faceless time. But for others, for every battle on the standard, there is memory of a comrade, a human touchstone, a private personal ceremony takes place. Following tradition, the color is trooped before the squadron. Led by its commanding officer and joined now by the standard and its escort, the squadron marches past in slow, and then quick time. future, there will be other ceremonies, celebrated by other generations. They will create traditions which will stagger even the wildest imaginations among the men of Drake or Nelson, the men of Wellington or Haig, and Perks and Crerar. And the new, in their turn, will be remembered and will be honored. And they, in their turn, will be replaced. So in ceremony, we will forever be tied to the past, forever bound to the traditions. And men not yet born will become soldiers. And they in their turn will fly the same skies, march the same march, honor the same dead. And through ceremony, the generations will stay inexorably linked forever and ever.